good. Uh, let's get started. So yesterday we talked about uh, recursive types. And we saw how to um, write a well-typed diverging term in our language, which now has recursive types. So here it is, just as a refresher, the simply typed lambda calculus, now with recursive types added, is up on the board, everything that we talked about yesterday. Um, so we've added these type variables alpha, recursive types mu alpha tau. We've extended our expressions with fold E and unfold E to switch views between um, you know, the folded and unfolded version of a recursive type. Um, and we've extended our call by value semantics. And in particular, the critical part here is that when we unfold a fold of a value, we get the underlying value. Right? That's how we run things. Um, and here are the type rules that we added, the typing rules that we added yesterday. So fold is the introduction form for recursive types. It's how we introduce a recursive type. Um, and if, if E has type tau with mu alpha tau for alpha, then fold E has type mu alpha tau. And unfold E does the reverse. It's the elimination form. And somebody asked me at the end of class yesterday, why is it that the value forms have a fold V? The value forms will always be you know, the canonical form for every, every type. The canonical forms for every type will be our values. Um, so fold V is, is the canonical, you know, is the value form that we'd add to our semantics. Okay, so what we're gonna do today is essentially take um, the type safety proof that we did using the, the logical relation we set up and extend that to prove type safety for this non-terminating language, right? Something has changed in a big way. Before every single expression in our language, every well-typed expression in our language uh, would terminate. And now it, it doesn't, as we saw with omega yesterday when we um, showed how it was well typed. Okay, so. Oh. Uh, so we're going to set up a unary logical relation very much like yesterday. I'm going to set up the value interpretation of types and then. Uh, the term interpretation, and we'll take it from there. So the new type that we've added to our language is mu alpha tau. So that's where the interesting thing is going to happen, basically. Oh, sorry. Okay. So. Um, we're going to, again, define the value interpretation of type. So let's just start out with bool and do the obvious thing. We want type safety, just like yesterday. What are the values that belong, that have type bool? True and false. True and false. All right. And just like yesterday, what are the functions that belong to the value interpretation of type tau and or tau 2? What's the value form for functions? Lambda. Thank you. <laughs> Just shout it out. <laughs> OK, lambda. And we then have to you know, do what we've been doing when setting up these logical relations. We have to, in order to say when a lambda belongs to this function, we have to think about how we use that lambda, right? the elimination form issue. And we have to say, all right, so a lambda um, belongs, this should be a tau 1. Uh, lambda x dot e belongs to the interpretation of tau 1 or tau 2. If you give me any argument that is valid at the argument type tau 1, then it must be the case that once I, do, once I apply the function to that argument, e with v for x belongs to um, the term interpretation of the result type tau 2. And it is in our definition of the e relation that we'll say that um, you know, if a term runs uh, and reaches some irreducible state, then it must belong to the value relation at that type, just like yesterday, right? Okay, but now, let's do the interesting bit. How do we interpret mu alpha tau? What are the values? What is the canonical form for mu alpha tau? Fold, okay. So when does the fold V belong to mu alpha tau? Again, we want, it, we want to add things to our interpretation, uh, keeping type safety in mind. But um, so let's think 
about the elimination form, right? This is a value of recursive type. How do we use values of recursive type? What's the elimination form? Hmm? Unfold. Unfold, right. OK, so just like here we're saying something about what happens when we apply this lambda, here um, we need to say something about what happens when we unfold this fold. Right, so we kind of need to say if we unfold that value. By the way, what happens when we unfold that value? What type will this expression have? If this fold v has type mu alpha tau, then this entire expression has type tau with mu alpha tau for alpha, right? Up there. OK. So um, really what we want to say is that when we use this fold, when we apply the elim form to it, we want to get something that is well behaved, has our property of interest. Seem reasonable so far? Yes? OK. Great. OK. Let's do that. That's a, that's a straightforward simplification, right? The operational semantics right up there tells you unfold of a fold v is just a v, right? It's just going to step to that. So we could simplify this. We don't have to say unfold of fold v. We could just talk about the v underneath because we know that that's what it's going to step to. So let's do that. So we can just talk about v. Oh, and if it's a v, then we can just talk about the v being in the value relation since it's a v. Good? OK, so that's a good simplification. Now, um, let's stare at this definition. Is it good? The logical relation is de defined by induction on the type, the structure of types. So let's look at whether what we've just added to our logical relation um, you know, is well-founded. So we're trying to give the interpretation of a type mu alpha tau. Inside the definition, we are referring to the interpretation of a bigger type. That's a serious problem. <laughs> so um, this logical, logical relation is no longer well-founded. Um, this was, in fact, an open problem for many years, uh, how you solve that. If you look at uh, Benjamin Pierce's second book, Advanced Topics in programming languages. Um, Andrew Pitts has a chapter in there and the, on logical relations. And the very last exercise in that chapter, which has I don't know how many stars, dot, 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 <laughs> like <laughs> on it, open problem, was how do we do logical relations for you know, genuine recursive types where um, you can have, you know, it's not just inductive uh, recur recursive types that allow you to indu uh, do inductive definitions, but also you know, uh, omega like we saw yesterday. All right. OK, so here's how we're going to solve this. Um, we're going to use something called step index logical relations. And here's the basic idea of step index logical relations. Um, basically, we are going to index our relation with a step k. All right? And when we write that some value belongs to the interpretation of tau for k steps, that's how I want you to read this. All right? We're going to say a value belongs to the interpretation of tau for k steps. What that means is that if, if I give you the value and you run for k or fewer steps, as in you use it in some program context for k or fewer steps, you're never going to notice that it is not a tau. However, if you use it in a context that wants to run for more than k steps, then you might notice that it's, n it's not a tau, as in you might get stuck. Okay? So it's a way of, of giving you an approximate guarantee. Right? And we're going to use this to make our definition, um, we're going to use it as an induction metric to make our definition well-founded. All right? But that, that idea of running a program and how many steps your context can take you know, in using that thing, that's, that's very um, useful in terms of um, seeing why this will all make sense. All right, so that's how we're going to define these now. So basically I'm saying let's go back and index our logical relation with um, some natural number k. All right, k will always be a natural number when you, the step index will always be a natural number. All right, so um, let's do this again. What are the values that belong to the type bool that look like they have type bool for k steps? 
true or false. We don't care what k is, right? OK. Ooh, functions are harder. <laughs> what are the va When does a lambda belong or look like it has type tau on our tau 2 for k steps, for up to k steps? So let's think again. What can we do with a lambda? And, and let's, let's draw ourselves a little timeline, all right? So for lambda, we're going to draw ourselves a little timeline. We have a quota. We are going to zero. We have k right now, OK? Um, this is decreasing down. <laughs> as, as we run our program, we're going to run out of steps. So we have k steps right now. And at some point, we're going to run out of steps. That's the intuition. All right. So right now, at k steps, we have a lambda in our hands. That's what this part of the definition is, is starting off, right? We have a lambda in our hands. We have k steps. OK, how are we going to use it? How do you use a lambda? You apply it. You apply it. When are you going to apply it? Next hmm? step. Next step? Oh, but, but what, if, what if I'm sitting in a program context like this? Lambda x colon tau 1 dot e. Um, and some arbitrary argument over there. So I have k steps right now. This is what my program looks like. Notice that I'm, I can use a whole bunch of steps to reduce this guy down to a value, right? Right? I could use an arbitrary number of steps to get the argument down a value, as in I could be doing other work. Even though I have k steps right now and I have a lambda in my hand, I could use, I meaning this time the context, can, might use up a whole bunch of steps to do other work. In this case, reduce that argument down to a value. And only then will the context go ahead and use the lambda as an apply. Right? OK. So on our timeline, it's useful to think about, you know, we're going to use up some number of steps. Um, and then in the future, when we have um, j steps left, OK? That's when we're actually going to do the beta reduction step. All right? So basically, I'm asking you to imagine that right here, you have k steps left. You used up a, a number, and now you have j steps left. OK? All right. So at this j point, we are saying that we are going to take our lambda and apply it to some argument. Right? The argument was v here of the right type. OK, and then what's going to happen? Oh, actually, um, I'll call that j. And then we're going to take one step, and we're going to get e with v for x. OK? And then from then on, we want to know that this e, for e with v for x looks like it has the right type for how many steps? How many do we have left? j. j. All right, so let's do this in the definition. We want to say that for all j less than k, where j is that you know, number of steps that you will have left in the future, okay? for all j, actually, we can make this a less than or equal to k, because maybe you already have a value in your hand and you want to apply the lambda right now. That's fine. This is not going to cause us a problem. Um, OK, uh, so for all j less than k, for all values, such that the value looks like it has the right argument type for j steps. See, we don't need that value to have the right type at k, right? Because we didn't get to that value until some point in the future. So it's only there that you know once we've done the beta reduction that we, that we meaning now the lambda, needs to know that the value that it was passed is good for the remaining number of steps, which is j. All right? OK. So at some point in the future, if you give me a value that is good for the number of steps that I have left, which is j, uh, then we will do the beta reduction. And it must be the case that e with v for x is good or type safe at the result type tau 2 for the remaining number of steps j. OK. Um, so technically, I'm saying that this is k minus j, right? 
It's just how you write it. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. What about the one step of the beta reduction? I was really hoping someone would ask. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've, I've um, basically, you could say, well, you said that, you know, we got here, and right before the beta reduction, we have j steps left. Right, I kind of said that. I was kind of lying. Why, why am I sort of, you know, playing with this? Why am I not counting the beta reduction step in a sense? Um, basically, I mean, if you have a, let's say you have a lambda xx, right, and you apply it to some value, um, right now you have j plus 1 steps left, all right? But you don't need to know that the value is good for j plus 1, because your beta reduction is going to eat up one step, and then you are going, this is going to reduce to just v, so you only need to know that it's good after the beta reduction, if you see what I mean, all right? It's just a little tiny little detail. It's not a huge deal, but that's, that's why this is okay. All right? So think of it as when we got here, we had j plus 1 steps left. It's really after the beta reduction that we have, you know, j steps left. But it's okay for that argument to be okay, you know, to be good for j steps, not for j plus 1, because we can't test it in any way until after we eat up one step for the beta reduction. Yes? Um, yes, I think that that works out just fine as well. Okay. Yeah, there are some little, you know, one um, number kinds of things that uh, you, you know work out fine. They're harmless. You can define the entire logical relation one way or another as long as the whole thing ends up being well found. That's exactly what's going on. So now this logical relation is being defined by induction on the step index followed by an inner induction on the type structure. Okay? All right. Okay, so um, of course if you look at um, our function interpretation, that is still well-founded even if you ignore the steps, right? Because it was well-founded before. The real reason we did this is so that we can handle recursive types. So let's see how we can use our step index to do something about recursive types. Okay, so now we want to say, um, we want to know if fold v belongs to mu alpha tau or looks like it has type mu alpha tau for k steps, <coughs> right? Okay, so again, let's go back to what I had here before. That's the thing that we really wanted to know was good for tau, you know, um, at the type tau with mu alpha tau for alpha. But then we changed it. We said, oh, but unfold of fold is just going to give us the underlying v. Oh, but guess what? In that step, we are, in that one step, we're eating up a step, right? That's the good thing. So this v, fold v belongs to this type if the underlying v is good for one less step, correct? That's how we're breaking the circularity. All right, in fact, let's just make it a little bit more general. We'll say for all j strictly less than k, um, we just need v to be, um, to look like it has the right type, tau with mu alpha tau for alpha, for j steps. Here, the strictly less than is critical, right? Otherwise, our definition would not be well-founded. Yes, Ben. Ah, um, the, so I could have written this definition differently, right? I think you're, you're thinking about this number of steps that I'm using up. The number of steps I'm using up is k minus j, right? And j is the number I have left. So I'm saying at some point in the future, when I have j steps left, you give me an argument that's good for the remaining number of steps j, and after my beta, beta reduction, my expression will be good for exactly that remaining number of steps j. So the number of steps that I used up in getting from you know, my original state k to someone actually having done the beta reduction, number of steps I used up is k minus j. Okay? This is going to come back in just one second. Let me write down the definition of the e relation. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly it. 
OK. <laughs> and now everyone's intuition is going to have to be a little reversed. Um, so let's talk about when an expression E looks like it has type tau, as in it won't get stuck. Um, uh, it looks like it has type tau for k step. So as in it won't get stuck for k step, it might get stuck after that. Yes? Uh, these are all closed right now, right? So we define the value interpretation of type with closed values. Ah. Okay, yes. So our types now have a type variable. There's an alpha there. What am I doing about my alpha? Well, for now, I don't have any polymorphism in my language. So look at what I did. This is the only place where the, al where the alphas are relevant, right? This is the only time tau has an alpha free in it. But I very cleverly go off and make sure I close it. So I right now, the model on the board, um, we're only interpreting closed types. We never do V of an open type. So we don't need any to handle open types or type variables in any particular way. So the V relation, the E relation on the board right now are interpretations of closed types, even though we've added type variables to our language. And this is a special thing about recursive types. Yeah. This is a Kutsky model. <laughs> and we'll talk about that in, in just a few minutes. Let's finish off uh, the, the basic statement of the logical relation. All right, so um, again, intuitively speaking, when does E look like it has type tau for k step? So what's going on now? I'm saying k is your upper bound. If you go do something with this term for more than k steps, use it somehow, run it, for more than k steps, all bets are off. Okay, so that means that we have to say something here about e, uh, but restrict ourselves to fewer than k steps. So we have to say that um, if you run e and it reaches an irreducible step uh, state in fewer than k steps, then that irreducible thing that you have must be a value. More than that, we're not even going to talk about it. You can't say anything. OK? So for all j less than k, um, and for all e prime, if our e steps to e prime, and this time I'm using j steps, not k minus j. So if I use up j steps to get to some e prime that is irreducible, then that e prime must be a good value that belongs to the value interpretation of our type tau for how many steps? K minus j, because we used up j. OK? So we had k. We ran e till we get got to e prime. We used up, this time this is j. All right, we used up j steps. So now we have k minus j left, so we have 0. Maybe I should have used an n here, <laughs> just to uh, avoid that confusion. Yeah? Why not less than or equal? OK, so let's see. Um, so I said that you can, so here we clearly need a less than, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't be well-founded. Um, so let's look at uh, what's going on here. Um, so um, less than if you use up all of the steps, ah, yes, OK, so your budget is k. If I pick a j that is actually equal to k, um, then I've used up all of it, then really I don't know anything about the result. That's my loose intuition. I mean, I'm not claiming that this becomes, uh, yeah? V sub 0 of bool is still true false. V sub 0 bool, bool is still true false. It's still true false. Huh? So you still know things about bool that are false. That's the problem. That's what I'm trying to avoid. In the sense that at 0, I want to say that anything can, I kind of want to say that anything can belong to my type. 
because I can't do anything with it. In the in the E relation, yes, not in the V relation, right? Okay. Yeah, this is, this is the conjunction, right? So it says, um, for all E prime such that E reduces to, e prime, to an E prime that is irreducible, uh, then that E prime must be in the value interpretation of cap. Okay? All right. So, so that is our well-founded logical relation as far as the, the closed values and closed terms are uh, concerned. And now we need to scale this up just like yesterday. We need to talk about substitutions, right? We need to talk about the interpretation of gamma, and we need to talk about defining the top level relation for open terms. Okay? So we do that. Um, we're going to say the interpretation of an empty gamma, just like yesterday, is going to be an empty substitution. But now we need a subscript k here. And if we interpret gamma with um, x maps x has type tau, then we want to say that uh, some gamma extended with x maps to v belongs to or satisfies this uh, type. Um, if little gamma belongs to our interpretation of big gamma for the appropriate number of steps, k, the same number, and the value that we've just added to our substitution looks like it has the appropriate type, tau, from there for the number of steps k. So it's exactly the same thing as yesterday, just with k's. Right? OK. And finally, we're going to say that an, ex an open expression E semantically has the type tau. Right? We're using this for semantically has the type. Um, if you give me good input, I give you good outputs, right? So if you give me a gamma, ooh, wait, what about the k? What do I put here? For all k, exactly. That's that's the whole point. So for all k. For all natural numbers, so for all k greater than or equal to zero, if you give me a good substitution, a substitution that is good for k steps, or think of it as inputs that are good for k steps, uh, then when you take your program E and close it off with the input, so to speak, then you get program that you can go ahead and run without getting stuck for up to k steps. I was kind of expecting that for all the being exists. Hmm. Like no. There is some amount of people that would allow you to evaluate. Um, so the thing is, we're only adding this approximation. We really do want to say something about forever. Um, we, want, we want our logical relation to say something about what happens for any number of future steps. It's just that we're having to stratify, right? In order to define these interpretations, and in particular this interpretation, we're having to restrict ourselves to, to knowing something less, right? To having a certain budget. But at the end of the day, you want to say, no matter what budget you start me out with, if you give me an input that satisfies that budget, I'm going to guarantee that the program will run without getting stuck as long as we don't go over the budget again. Okay? I think the English is very useful in terms of understanding what it's saying. So the for all says, give me a budget, an arbitrary number. Pick one at the beginning. And then just give me inputs that are good for that budget. All right? Okay. So, um, so this is our step index logical relation. And now we will go through the usual exercise. So um, again, remember we, we've been dividing the proof up into part A and part B. Part A is always proving the fundamental property. So 
we would want to prove that um, that if something is syntactically well typed, then it belongs to our logical relation. It is semantically well typed. So we'd want to prove that again. And just like yesterday, we would then want to prove that um, if something is in our logical relation, right, a closed term that is semantically good, so to speak, that's in our relation, um, that is going to be safe. All right, um, so what I'd like to do is just do one case of the proof of the fundamental property. Right? Actually, before I go there, um, what do we need? Um, there's another intuition here. So we're setting this up to say E looks like it has, or rather, let's focus on the values. A value looks like it has the type tau for K steps. right? That means that it, uh, if you take more steps, if you use it for more steps, you ha all bets are off. Okay, so it looks like it has type tau for, a, for k steps. That means it has to look like it has type tau for fewer steps, right? That just sort of logically follows. All right, and that property is a property that we're going to have to prove as a lemma. It's sometimes referred to as downward closed or monotonicity. But basically, it is trying to capture the intuition that I just said. That if um, you have V that belongs to the value interpretation of any type tau for k steps, and you have some j that is less than or equal to k, uh, then the same value must belong to that interpretation of tau for fewer steps. That's an absolute must. We need that property. We'll need it in our proofs of the fundamental property. Okay? And you can see how it just sort of follows from, in, from the intuition that we've set up for what, what the step index means. Okay? So if it looks like it has type tau for k steps, then it looks like it has that same type for fewer steps. All right. Okay. Um, now, maybe now is a good time for me to address the question about Kripke models. Um, for those of you, uh, so, Kripke models are basically, I don't want to go into too much detail. Um, Kripke models are also called possible world models. It's where you want to make a statement. In this case, we want to make a statement about a value belonging to a type, or looking like it has a type, relative to some number, right? Usually in a Kripke model or a possible world model, you have, it's, those models are, uh, are, you know, you use them when you want to say that something belongs to a type with respect to some particular world. The step index here is the state of our world. It is telling us how many steps we have left right now. Okay? That's the connection with the with Kripke models or possible world models. All of the step indices here are worlds, exactly as you would expect in a Kripke model. And I'm just going to stop with that. Yeah? You wrote Kripke on the board. Yes. Um, <laughs> Named after Saul Kripke. Kripke. Okay. Um, Kripke are possible worlds. They're known as both. Possible worlds models generally have, have a monotonicity property like this, which basically says that if something belongs to a type in the current world, then it must belong to the type in all future worlds. That's exactly what this is saying. If value belongs to type, in the current world where we have k steps left, then in some future world where we've used up some of our steps and have fewer steps left, the value must still belong to the type. All right, so the monotonicity property in Kripke models is always about the val if the value belongs to the type now, it belongs to the type in all future worlds. All Kripke models will have that sort of a uh, lemma. Okay, here our world is very simple. It's just a step in there. Okay, um, so let's do one case of the proof. Uh, let's do fold. Uh, oh, by the way, actually, this is a very interesting lemma to prove. Um, it's really actually rather, s so how would you prove this lemma? By induction on, sorry, louder? K 
no. Types. Types. Exactly. For every single type, we want to prove that this holds. All right? So let's just quickly inspect. Um, if tau is bool, true or false belong to it for k, obviously they belong to it for j, right? Because the definition doesn't even use the step index. All right. The interesting one is functions. If we had set up this function definition differently, like you might say, why? I mean, I sort of explained it to you with a timeline and all of that, right? Um, but if you change this definition to say something like, um, suppose I don't actually say for all j less than k. I just say, I omit that, and I say, if you give me an argument that's good for k, then I will give you something that's good for k. You will fail to prove monotonicity. OK? And I always like to alert people about this, because it's, uh, it's one of those things that you have to know or you have to fail in the proof to see it. OK? Um, so so let's, just, let's do that case, all right? We're just going to do functions. Um, so when this tau is actually a function type, we want to say that we have a value, in this case it's going to be a lambda, that belongs to the type tau1 arrow tau2, right? And we want to show that for some j that's smaller, that less than or equal to k, we want to show that the value, the lambda again, belongs to the same type for fewer steps j. Right? OK? So I've already said that the value is a lambda. Let me just write it as such. Um, lambda x tau 1 e. OK, so we want to show this. Let's look at the definition. It says, give me an argument. So we say, OK, suppose we have an, uh, well, suppose, ah, the first thing it tells us, we're trying to show that something is in v at j steps, right? So this wants us to assume some step index that's lower. So let's suppose that we have an i less than or equal to k, sorry, j, all right? And we have, and then we get to suppose that we have an argument that is good for this number of steps i at the type tau 1. And we have to show that e with v for x is good at the result type for, for same number of steps i. Right? OK, so how do we do that? Well, let's use our premise. We know that the lambda belongs to tau 1 or tau 2 for k steps. So let's go use that definition. If we go use that definition, it first asks us for some step index that's less than or equal to k. Well, since i is less than j, clearly it's less than k. OK? So i suffices. And then we can just say, all right, we already have, we can use this v to instantiate that definition. We can say we already have a value that's good for i steps, and then we get that um, exactly what we want to show. All right? Now try that proof, but without the j less than or equal to k in the definition. Try it with just k or something, and see what goes wrong. All right. Let's do one case of the fundamental property. We'll do fold. So. Fold E has type mu alpha tau. If E has type tau with mu alpha tau for alpha. Yeah. Well, you said that the number was proved by induction on tau. It's actually lexicographic order of induction on tau and k. You look to see step to you. So actually, I, I went through this little exercise yesterday. Um, the recursive type case falls out just fine without doing induction on the step index with the definition as it's currently written. And I can do the proof to show you. But if we had written this definition with a k minus 1 here, instead of a j less than, strictly less than k, then we need the induction on the step index. Tiny but important point. Yeah. OK. So um, we want to prove the fundamental property. So what are we trying to show? Um, well, 
we are trying to show that our fold E expression is semantically well typed. Right? That's what we need to show. Expand our definition. Let's figure out. Um, so we get to assume that we have a K. We get to assume that we have a substitution that's good for K. And then we have to show that the closed program is good as well. All right? So suppose that we have K greater or equal to 0. And suppose that we have a substitution gamma that it satisfies the environment, but only for our budget, budgeted K sets. And now we have to show that gamma E belongs to E at the type mu alpha tau, but for k sets. Right? OK. Um, so in order to show that, we get to assume that there's some j strictly less than k, and that our fold E expression runs down to something irreducible. Right? So we get to say, suppose that we have a j less than k, and suppose that, oh, I wrote that wrong. This is gamma applied to fold E. Right? OK. Um, so now we say, suppose that, oh, let's push the gamma in. <laughs> fold of gamma E suffices to show this. All right. Now we'll say, suppose that fold of gamma E reduces in j steps to some E prime. j steps to some E prime. And we know that that E prime is irreducible. Now we have to show, what do we have to show? That the E prime. that the E prime is in the value interpretation of mu alpha tau for k minus j steps. Right? OK. Um, so how might we show that? <clears throat> First, let's just look at what we've assumed. We've assumed that this fold has run down to an irreducible thing, right? The operational semantics for this language is deterministic. We can very easily infer from this fact that therefore the gamma E that's sitting under there has also you know, had to have reduced to z down to something irreducible. right? So by the operational semantics, we know that it must be the case that um, that at some point the gamma E must have reduced to some sort of E1 in some J1 steps where J1 is less than or equal to the J that we know we took. Right? If fold E got down to a value in J steps, then the thing underneath it must have got da gone down to a value in less than or equal to J steps. That's at least the bare minimum that we can conclude. And we know that uh, E1 is irreducible and irreducible E1. OK, so we know something about the E being run and be reaching something irreducible. Where's E? Up there. So it's time to use our induction hypothesis and learn something about the E. By the induction hypothesis, we know that E is semantically good, <laughs> well-typed, in the logical relation, so to speak, um, at that type. Now we can instantiate this with, we need a step index, and we need some inputs that are good for up to that step. OK, well, we have, uh, how about we instantiate it with k, with k is greater than 0, uh, and gamma. We already have a gamma, and we know it's good for k, so that's why I picked this k. right? And note that this is good for k. So if I instantiate this with the k and the substitution, I get that gamma e is in the e interpretation of tau with mu alpha tau for alpha for k steps. Right? 
Okay, now, we have this fact. If we have this fact, this fact says that, hey, if the term that you have gets to some irreducible st state in fewer than k steps, then I can tell you something about what you got to, right? So we know that this gamma E reaches this irreducible E1 in J1 steps. So let's instantiate this definition with instantiate with um, the J1 steps that we know we're going to use up in running this down. So instantiate it with J1 and instantiate it with um, what this runs down to, which is E1, right? So we know that gamma E reduces to E1 in J1 steps. That's what we have right here. So we're just plugging that in. And what do we get? We get that that E1 then has to be in the V interpretation of tau with mu alpha tau for alpha for how many steps? <laughs> I'll help you out. K minus J1. <laughs> All right. Um, so what do we need to show? Um, well, what we've, what's actually happened, let me switch here, is that we had a fold gamma E, and we took J1 steps, and we claim that we got to fold of this E1. And this E1 is the thing that we have just managed to show is actually a value. So let me call it V1. All right, here on the board, I'm going to call it V1 just to remind ourselves that we know it's a value. Um, Oh, but what did we know overall? We knew that this guy reduces to E prime in J steps, right? And that E prime was irreducible. What's the connection between this E prime and this fold V1 here? Is fold V1 a value? Can you reduce fold V1? It, it's definitely irreducible, right? So it must be E prime, right? We ran this down to something irreducible. This is irreducible. Then we went the other way and said, oh, OK, so if this took J steps, we know that this must have reduced to, to the E1 in J1 steps. But now we've just discovered that, OK, that E1 was a value. And now we look at the fold V1. That's a value form. It can't go any further. So if this reduced to this irreducible form, and we know that this reduced to this irreducible form, those two forms are the same in this deterministic language. That's the point I'm trying to make. All right? OK, so now at this point, we know that the E prime that we had supposed at the very beginning must be equal to fold of this V1. So our remaining proof obligation is to show Remember, our proof obligation was to show that E prime is in this. So now our proof obligation is to show that this fold is in the V interpretation of mu alpha tau. I'm just copying right off of here for k minus j steps. That's what we have to show. And we know that j equals j1. Exactly, by inspection of the operational semantics. So. There we go, right? OK. All right. So um, the proof isn't all that different from you know, many of the other cases that we were doing until yesterday. Uh, it's just that now we have to keep track of these steps, and you sometimes have to do a little bit of uh, careful reasoning about the steps. Um, in some of the proof cases, you will have to appeal to the downward closed gamma. Okay. Uh, for example, for lambda. And just to give you an intuition for why for lambda, um, for lambda, remember we end up um, at some point having to extend the environment. We extend the substitution with a new value. In the lambda proof, we'll only know that that value is good for fewer steps. And there, that's where we'll have to use monotonicity functions. OK. Um, so that's fold and um, you know you can do all you can do the unfold case and and I especially encourage you to do the lambda case um, of this proof on your own uh, and make sure that 
you know, it all goes through. The application case is a little bit long. You can sort of factor it if you set up some uh, helper lemmas, but, or you could just sort of push through and unroll definitions. Either way works fine. All right. Um, any questions? Before we switch gears. Yes. Uh, yeah, so like yesterday, I was giving you the example of lists and trees, right? So we needed sums and so on. So um, assume that we add those to this language. Um, I, I was just sort of focusing on recursive types in particular. Um, but if we do add, you know, sums or something to our language, let's say, um, that's a straightforward extension with this. We would say that for k steps uh, in left of v1, let's say, uh, looks like it has the sum type. If here you don't even need to de uh, decrement, I mean, what did we do yesterday? Yesterday we said if the v1 looks like it has type tau1, today we have to add a step index here, right? We can just use k. Or we can use one less than k. Either one will work just fine, right? One less than k works just fine if you say that when you do a case on an in left, you use up a step. But the definition is well founded even if I just use k. And of course, just like yesterday, then we need to throw in in right. I mean, does this sort of answer your question? I can throw in other types, and then I can do all sorts of interesting things in this language. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, okay, that, that was not my, my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's take this question offline, if that's okay. All right? Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so I want to introduce polymorphism next. Yes? Um, so you said in showing that, well, saying that each time you just follow V1 because both of them are equivalent to just following both, which is what you told Gamma and me. Yeah. Is, is, that, is that obvious? And if so, you said that it's because the language is like deterministic. Mm -hmm. Um, if the language weren't deterministic, uh, so we've, we've set up logical relations for concurrency, for example, and then a lot of things become difficult. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly you have to then take care with, you know, what kind of reasoning you do based on the operational connect. I'll just sort of leave it at that. Because, yeah, you can't just say, you know, it's deterministic, therefore I know that this will happen. But then it depends on the particular proof case and the rest of the machinery that you've set up for your logical relations, um, which can be quite involved in the process of concurrency, for example. So, okay. All right. Um, okay. So, um, all right. So that was recursive type step indexing, the basic idea. Um, I'd like to now switch to polymorphism and parametricity. Right? And in particular, let's start setting up binary logical relations. Let's start talking about program equivalence rather than just type safety and termination. All right? So um, polymorphism. So just like in the simply typed lambda calculus, we have uh, in the simply typed lambda calculus, we have lambda. Lambda allows us to abstract over terms. Uh, in Bob's uh, lectures, you have learned about dependent types. Uh, in dependent types, you have types that can depend upon terms. Now we're going to introduce uh, terms that can depend upon types. Okay? So just like lambda there lets, um, is basically abstracting over a term variable, we're going to introduce a new lambda that lets you abstract over type variables. And 
The reason this is useful is to write polymorphic code or generic code. Okay? So for example, you might want to implement, let's say you want to Im uh, implement a function that sorts um, a list, right? So you write a function that sorts a list of integers in uh, ascending order or something. Um, and then you want to write another sort function that uh, sorts a list of strings, maybe in descending order. Uh, and then you'd like to factor your code and uh, basically write one sort function. So let's say we started out with uh, sort int that took some sort of int list and gave us back an int list. Uh, but now we want to write a generic sort function that takes a list of arbitrary elements. Could be integers, could be strings, right? But sorts it in some order. We'll write a generic sort function that, for an arbitrary type, let's call it alpha, I could give it a list of those alphas, where alpha could be a string or it could be an integer. And I could pass in um, a comparison function that knows how to compare alphas, all right? So I'm going to pass in a function that takes two alphas and gives me back a Boolean. This is my comparison function, all right? And I could write this function so that whenever this comparison returns true, I put the first element you know, earlier in the list, so to speak, OK? That's not part of the type, but specifying it. And gives me back a list of alphas. So that is a generic sort function. That is the type of a generic sort function. It takes a generic list. We don't care what the elements of the list are. It takes a comparison function that knows how to compare elements of the list, whatever they might be, alpha. But the point here is that the sort function doesn't need to actually go and itself look at the elements of the list. It can treat them as opaque blobs, as signified by the alphas in the signature. Right? OK. So. Now we have a generic sort function that can work for our integer lists or lists of strings, right? So we can say um, sort uh, list of three, five. <laughs> it's already started. Um, three, seven, five. <laughs> um, oh, but by the way, the alpha. Hmm. What we really want to say here in the signature is that this is a sort function that works for all possible types alpha. Okay. This is a universal type. Um, so when we apply sort, we want to give it the type int to specify that, hey, we're going to use you, generic function, at the type int, which as soon as we save this, we have to then pass in a list of ints, because the alpha has now turned into an int, has been instantiated to an int by doing this. So that means we now need to pass in a list of integers. We need to pass in. Um, some comparison function on integers, and we will get back a sorted list. All right. Similarly, if we had done sort with a string type, then we can't pass in our list of integers. This would give us a type error. Fair enough? OK. So we need to pass in now a list of strings. and some sort of comparison function. Uh, string less than. Right? Because it is this act of instantiating our function with the type, this expression has type list of string paired with string, cross string, arrow bool, and then it gives us back a list of strings. OK, so um, let's extend our simply typed lambda calculus with polymorphism in this fashion with universal types so that we can write generic code. And then we will look at, um, then we'll look at properties that we get when we have polymorphism in our language. So here, note that we're doing, oh, what I didn't specify, is we want to be able to write down functions that abstract over types. So just as lambda x colon tau dot e abstracts over a term, x, right, the body here um, works for any abstract x, we are going to add lambda alpha dot e, which says 
this expression E abstracts over the type alpha. So this, was, this allows terms to depend on terms, and this allows terms to depend on types. I saw the lambda cube up here, right? Um, Peter talked about that yesterday. So we are now in, once we have terms that depend on types, we are basically, um, we're introducing system F. That corner of the lambda cube that you saw yesterday. Okay, so. I'm gonna get rid of the recursive types and we'll just do simply type lambda calculus, actually system F. Okay, so we still have type variables and now we have polymorphic types. All right, and the convention here is that alpha is a binding occurrence and alpha can appear free in that, in that type tau. Uh, the rest of our language is the same, except I'm erasing these, and I'm introducing two things, um, two terms. Uh, the introduction form for, um, for all types and the elimination form. So the introduction form is precisely this. I want to introduce a function that abstracts over types. And how do we use these things of polymorphic types? How do we use something that has type for all alpha tau? Well, the way that I showed you how to use the sort function, you take sort and you apply it to a type. So we're going to introduce an expression form for taking an expression and applying it to a type. Okay? So this is type abstraction and this is type application. All right. Um, now, let's... Uh, let's deal with the rules, heading rules first. Notice that we now have these alphas. Um, so I kind of glossed over this before uh, when we had recursive types, but here I really do need to deal with it. Um, we need a notion of a well-formed type, right? Because if I write down a type for all alpha, alpha arrow beta, this is not a well-formed closed type, right? But it is a well-formed type if I know that uh, alpha and beta are legitimate type variables in my type environment. So just as for lambdas, we had a term environment, we now need a type environment. I'm going to call it delta. Right? So we're going to introduce delta, which contains um, type variables. It's going to be our type environment. So delta can be an empty context, or it can be something with some type variables in it. And I'll use alpha and beta for type variables. And that means that our judgment overall is going to now have two environments, an environment where we keep all of the type variables that are in scope right now, and an environment where we keep all of the term variables. Yes? Oh, yes, you're right. Um, I only mean beta. Yes, thanks. Uh, yes, so here if we have, if, well, I should give you the form. This judgment says that the type tau is well formed in the environment delta. And really all it amounts to um, today is that all of the free type variables of tau are in delta. We define all of the rules of this judgment, that is all that that will amount to. All right? Okay. So, so I'm not going to write, well, should I write down the rules of this judgment? How many people want me to write it down? No? Okay, no. Yes? Ah, variables instead of binding. Um, I could make this a binding like that. Terms have types, right? So you're kind of, are you kind of asking type variables have what? Have what kind? That's kind of what it comes down to. Um, it says that we only have one kind of type in this language. It's called type, T-Y-P-E. So I'm not going to write it down, right? Otherwise, the concept of a delta is the same as the concept of a gamma, just at the type level instead of the term level. At the term level, gamma tells us that some variable x has a certain type tau. In delta, we want to say some type variable alpha or beta has some kind, usually we say kappa, 
In this case, we don't have, we only have one kind. It's called type. Um, so we don't have higher kinds in this language. For that, you would need to move to f omega, which you also saw in the lambda cube. Uh, so that's why I'm going to elide the kind for all of my type variables, because they all, I know what all their kind is. It's only one. Answer well, your question? OK. I could. I like to keep them separate just to okay. make it really clear that these are type variables and these are term variables. And you'll see why when we set up the logical relation. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, we can take our existing, so I'm not going to set up this judgment. Essentially, whenever I write this, treat it as free type variable of pound must appear in delta. Right? I'm not going to write out all, all the rules for it. Um, so assuming that we have that, we need to just go and edit our existing rules. Everything's going to have a delta sitting there. Uh, oh, and by the way, we want to make sure, so just as we, just as this says that a type tau is well formed in the environment delta, we want to extend that notion to a type environment gamma is well formed in the environment delta. And what this means is that all of the types that appear in the range of gamma, they have to be well formed in delta. So. Um, for all x in the domain of gamma, uh, gamma, the free type variables, so to speak, are, let me not write that. Gamma x is going to give you the type. That has to be well formed in the environment delta. All right? So what that really means is that when I write this down, I, I want to make sure that the rules that I write down here always enforce the fact that uh, tau is well formed in delta and gamma is well formed in delta. That's going to be an invariant for this judgment. Right? And uh, to enforce that here in particular, in the variable case, we really should say that this gamma is good under delta. And then, of course, we have the other about x's type. Right? OK. And the rest of them are straightforward. We just sprinkle deltas everywhere. You see why I strategically left space in my typing rules today. Uh, OK, so um, now let's add the two new interesting rules for these two terms, ter uh, type abstractions and type application. So under delta gamma, lambda alpha e has type for all alpha tau, we're going to do essentially what term abstraction does. Right? Term abstraction takes a variable, adds it to the environment, and then type checks the body. Type abstraction is going to take the type variable, add it to the type environment, leave gamma unchanged, and type check the body, and it better have type tau. OK? Um, and type application under delta gamma, E applied to a type, it's called a tau prime, uh, has what type? Well, in order to do type application, you have to make sure that the E has a for all type. Otherwise, you can't apply it to a type. So if E has type for all alpha tau, and what, what might you want to check about this tau prime before you do this application? Well formed? Yes. So under delta, tau prime better be well formed. Right? Because we're trying to type check this expression in this environment. This type better make sense in this delta environment. OK. And then what type do you think E applied to tau prime has? Substitute, yes. So we, it, it's going to have type tau, which now has a free alpha in it. We're going to close that off with our tau prime. OK. Uh, so there are our typing rules. Um, so as I said, term abstraction is the introduction form. Type, uh, sorry, type of abstraction is the introduction form. Type application is the elimination form. We should extend our values. Um, and we're going to extend it with for all, sorry, lambda alpha e. 
Because lambda alpha e is a suspended computation, right? It's a function. It's waiting for someone to apply it to a type. And only then do we run the body of this. Uh, and let's edit our operational semantics. So this is already a value. When you run into a type application, you want to evaluate this down to a value before you can actually do the type application. So we're going to extend this with uh, an evaluation context that looks like that. And there's no concept of running type. Okay, and then we're going to extend our reduction rules with type application. So lambda alpha e applied to a type tau reduces to e with tau substituted for alpha in the body of that function. Okay, so so there's system f. Now let's talk about interesting properties of system F. Um, so I did a little bit of this on, um, on the first day. Uh, if E has type for all alpha, alpha or alpha, our favorite <laughs> example <laughs> for polymorphic types, what can we say about the behavior of this type? It's the identity function, yes. So we talked about this on the first day, that if I take E, let me state it as a theorem. Um, if E is a closed term, now I have two dots here, I just, I'm gonna elide them. If E is a closed term of type for all alpha, alpha, or alpha, then, and I have a closed type tau, any arbitrary tau, and I have a closed value. Again, there are two dots here, but I'm lighting them. A closed value of this type tau. Then I can prove to you that if you take E and apply it to tau, and then V, right? You pass in tau for the alpha, you pass in V for this alpha. You are, when you run this term, you're always going to get back the same V. And again, the idea here is that there's no way for this function to cough up an alpha on its own because it's promising to treat the input as a block, right? Okay, so that's a free theorem that follows as a consequence of parametricity in this language um, because we have abstraction over types. Uh, let's see, how about another free theorem? Yeah, how about if E has type here. Suppose that I have a closed term E and it has type for all alpha, alpha arrow bool. What can you tell me about that function or that term? It has to be? It has to be a constant function. And how might I state that as a theorem? Somehow equivalent. Okay. Um, Something like that? If you give me an arbitrary type tau and you give me a value v1 and a value v2 that both have that type tau, then these two expressions will reduce to exactly the same Boolean value. And I'll write that as, so I'm going to make, turn this into, this is going to denote contextual equivalent. If you take this expression and put it in any larger program and you run that program versus putting this expression into the same hole in the program, you will never be able to get different answers. Yeah? Sorry, what? That, uh, that was my next point. Yes. This is almost um, the simple one. We can, we can beef up our theorem even more. We can say, give me two different types. A, t 
towel one and a towel two. So give me a towel one that is closed, give me a towel two that is closed. They're arbitrary. And then give me a value v1 of type tau1 and give me a value v2 of type tau2. Then, if I run E with tau1 and v1, I'm going to get the same Boolean answer as when I run E with tau2 and v2. It doesn't matter that those types are different. Okay? And again, it all goes back to the type of this function. The function, when you run it, the input that we're giving it is, is an alpha. Suppose that I took e and I applied it to int and I passed in 5 versus e and I applied it to, um, for now I'll do int again, and 4. Since this argument must be treated as a blob, that's what the type says. There is no way that whatever, you know, whatever the body of this function is doing, it just can't inspect it. So since it can't inspect it, it has no choice but to return the same exact Boolean value every single time. That's what we mean by this is a constant function. It can't inspect its input. It must, no matter what you apply it to, it must return exactly the same thing that, you know, always. It either always returns true or, or always returns false. Okay, how do we prove theorems like that? That's where logical relations come in, all right? So this is a statement about equivalence, and you know, I've, I've told you that we use logical relations to prove uh, equivalence of programs. Um, stepping back from just like saying equivalence of programs, this doesn't have a contextual equivalence symbol anywhere in the statement of the theorem, right? But to prove free theorems like this, free theorems that follow as a consequence of parametricity, the technique that you have to use is a logical relation, right? And so that's, we're gonna uh, try to set up the logical relation um, to see how we do that. Um, given that I should be wrapping up, um, I'm going to start on the logical relation tomorrow. Today I just want to say a few words about, um, let me just use five minutes to tell you about contextual equivalence a little bit more formally so that, you know, we, we don't have to get into that tomorrow. So I've. I've sort of hand waved and told you in English what this means, but let's be more formal about it. Um, let's say that I'm going to write C for a program context, which is any complete program with a single hole in it. What do I mean by that? Um, well, I literally mean take all of these program expressions and anywhere that you find an E, stick a C there instead. All right, so a program context is something with a single hole in it. It's different from evaluation context. Evaluation context, look, I only said, hey, please go evaluate here. When we write down general program context, we can put context here as well. All right, so, so just to, to drill that home, um, let's inspect E and write down the grammar for context for this particular language. Here, we do nothing. It's a variable. Yeah. True, false, the if then else has if e, then e1, else e2. So for that, we're actually going to add if c, then e1, else e2. If e, then c, else e2. If e, then e1, else c. You see what I mean? That's the pattern. All right, to define the grammar. Uh, similarly, for functions, we need to actually add a form which says lambda x colon tau dot c. That says that somewhere inside, under that lambda, there is a hole into which you can go ahead and stick an expression, right? We are basically defining context to mean here's your whole program. Somewhere in there, there is a hole, and you get to stick uh, a program in there, you know, this expression versus this expression. The types have to line up. They have to be right. These two things, when I put them on the two sides of a contextual equivalence symbol, really I should be telling you what their types are because I have a type notion of contextual equivalence in mind in, for my type language. I can't just stick anything into the whole of this program because it has to have the right type, okay? So um, next, let's talk about application. So we're gonna have CE and EC for application. For lambda, we're going to have that. And for type application, we're going to have C tau. okay? That's what we mean by a program that has a single hole somewhere uh, into which we can embed our program expressions. 
OK, then contextual equivalence um, is going to be defined as follows. We say that. E1 is contextually equivalent to E2 at that type if something. So the way I want you to read this is we are already assuming that E1 has type tau under this environment and E2 has type tau under the in that same environment. They, their types match. Okay? And if their types match, then this is how we define contextual equivalence. We say, and by the way, contextual equivalence is also called observational equivalence because it's saying that no matter what complete program you embed this, these two expressions into, right, whether you embed E1 into that program or E2 into that program, you will never, the context will never be able to tell the difference, will not, never be able to observe a difference. Okay? So the way we do this is we say for all contexts, we need our context to be well typed. For all contexts, um, now the context has a hole, right, in it. And that hole is capable of accepting expressions of a certain type. In this case, we're, we wanted to accept expressions which satisfy that type, right? Notice that I'm eliding the E, but any expression that has type tau under that environment can be put into the hole of this context. And once we've put something into the whole of the context, we want to get back an expression that is closed. The delta is closed, the gamma is closed. And uh, let's say it has some type cool. Now let me explain that for a second. Um, in general, we're going to say, um, let's ignore the delta for a second, and I'll just explain it for simply type. Context typing is normally written like this, all right? So this says that um, into this context, you can embed any expression, E, uh, that has type tau under the environment gamma. So if I give you such an E, then C with E will have this type. It will have the type tau prime under the environment gamma. That's how to read what that is saying, OK? So what this is saying is that you can fit either one of these expressions into this context, and the complete program that you will get will be a closed program, and it will be something that gives you back a boolean. All right? OK, so back to contextual equivalence. E1 and E2 are contextually equivalent. If you give me a, a well-typed context, then C with E1 reduces to a value V, if and only if C with E2 reduces to the same value v. Notice that v here has to be a Boolean. So I can just write that. OK? In other words, the context will use the e1 and use the e2, but will always give you back the same answer. You won't be able to observe a difference between those two expressions. All right? And this is, of course, this definition is extremely handy for things like, uh, we talked about this on the first day. Um, let's say you have two different implementations of a stack. You want to be able to reason about the fact that they are equivalent. <coughs> maybe one is just more efficient than the other. Uh, maybe one uses an internally uses an array to represent the stack, and the other one internally uses li a list to represent the stack. But you want to be able to plug them in to, you know, you want to replace a less efficient implementation of the stack with a more efficient one, and know that the rest of your software system is going to remain unchanged. Nothing is going to break. Right? That, those are the situations where we want to use the, the idea of contextualism. All right. Um, so that's contextual equivalence. We're going to set up a logical relation tomorrow for system F, which will allow us to prove um, free theorems that follow as a consequence of parametricity. In particular, the theorem that I have up there and this theorem that we have up here. We're going to set up our logical relation so that whenever two expressions, E1 and E2, are logically related, let me write LR here to this, this 
distinguish it from contextually equivalent. We're going to set up our, our logical relation so that whenever two things are logically related in our logical relation, then they will be, that will imply that they are contextually equivalent. So in other words, we're going to set up something that um, is sound with respect to contextual equivalence. And then we'll talk about how to go in the opposite direction, that you know, making sure that your logical relation is such that whenever two things are contextually equivalent, they are related in that logical relation, right? Um, but but most, uh, most importantly tomorrow, I think, first we're going to set up the logical relation and, and do some proofs of three theorems, and we'll get to issues of um, context, you know, how the logical relation matches up with contextual equivalence uh, the day after. And, and in particular, notice based on what I just said, if anything that's logically related is contextually equivalent and vice versa, I can state this theorem with that instead of contextual equivalent, okay? And that's really kind of what, what we're headed towards. Um, oh, one, one more important comment before we stop. Look at this definition of contextual equivalent. So I'm, I'm sure that you can agree that this is a really important notion, right? It's how we reason about the fact that you can replace one implementation with another. It's very hard to prove, however, that two given um, stack implementations, let's say, are contextually equivalent. In general, it is very difficult to prove. And in general, doing a direct proof of two things being contextually equivalent is difficult because of this for all quantification. This statement is saying, two, in order to show that these two things, that these two expressions are equivalent, I have to go talk about e all possible contexts of a certain type. And in particular, if you normally try to do, um, for many examples, if you, if you try to turn the crank and maybe even do a direct proof of contextual equivalence by doing induction on the structure of C, you could say that that's a valid strategy, right? Something goes wrong. And it has to do with when your context is under a lambda. That becomes really difficult to reason about. That and that, actually, right? So people never, well, uh, people usually <laughs> don't do proofs of contextual equivalence directly because that's really hard, because of that for all quantification, um, and because context lets you go under a lambda. Instead, whenever you want to prove that two things are contextually equivalent, you use a proof method instead. You use either logical relations or another technique called Viking relations. Right? So I'm going to show you the logical relations for proving contextual equivalence. All right, that's it.